And we are live. And ciao. Great, thank you. Hello and welcome to the new Center for Research and Practices public session with the programmers. The new center is a para-academic institution that offers cutting edge seminars on art, philosophy and the humanities in general. Within it, we run four certificate programs, each of them led by one of our programmers. Critical Philosophy run by Reza Negrasani, Transdisciplinary Studies by Jason Mahage, Postplanetary Universal Design by Ed Keller and Carla Leto, and Art and Curatorial Studies run by Cecile Malaspina. My name is Anshal Saxena. I am a certificate student in the Critical Philosophy program and I will be starting postgraduate studies in MA Situated Practice at the Bartlett this September. I'm really excited and happy to be part of this public session that inaugurates our fall winter season and the ninth year of operations of the new Center for Research and Practice. As some of you may know, applications for the certificate programs are currently open with the possibility of receiving full and partial scholarships. If you are considering applying, this is a great chance to know about the new center as an institution, meet the programmers of our certificate programs, and also know more about our upcoming seminars. Our applications are open until September 5th, 2022, 2359 Eastern time. Applications should include a cover letter and a writing sample showcasing your intellectual interests and clarifying your need for financial relief. Applicants from the Global South will automatically be considered for 50% scholarships. Half of our full scholarship recipients are from the Global South and half are women. We will extend this automatic consideration to those affected by the war in Ukraine. In addition, we have launched a GoFundMe campaign, which will be used towards the tuition of our student, Ms. Islav Kazakov, and two full scholarships for Ukrainian applicants. The new Center for Research and Practice is an international nonprofit higher education institute in the arts, humanities, and sciences, offering graduate and professional development level certificate programs workshops, seminars, exhibitions, residencies, and conferences in art and curatorial practice, critical philosophy, post-planetary universal design, and transdisciplinary studies. Our carefully selected network of thinkers and scholars advise and assist those seeking to make the transition between undergraduate and graduate school between graduate school and the professions, and between early career to advanced career development. So studying at the new center, students practice graduate and professional level research in a manner that does not interrupt their existing artistic, academic, or professional aspirations, but instead complements, enhances, and intensifies them. If you're interested in knowing more about us, our programs and upcoming seminars, you can check our YouTube channel and also access our website. And if you have any questions that might not be answered along with the presentations, please just write them in the YouTube chat so we can read them after. Now to introduce our programs. Reza Negrastani is responsible for the Critical Philosophy Program, which is devoted to developing philosophy adequate to addressing the problems and questions posed by the 21st century, mainly the necessary transformation of concepts of reason and thought as they pertain to the development of artificial intelligence and automation. In addition, 
the rise of the Anthropocene, which threatens global stability, One moment, please. In addition, the rise of the Anthropocene, which threatens global stability, developments in physics, neurology, and biology, transformations in global capitalism, and the way in which the military, media, and economic systems are now intertwined and exceed the boundaries of nation states have all generated new conceptual challenges for philosophy. These transformations have posed a set of questions about the nature of reality, knowledge, politics, and ethics that cannot fully be addressed by the resources of traditional philosophy alone and require new philosophical concepts. This season, this program will be counting on the seminars by Negrastani himself, The Vicious Transparency of Time, and our instructors, Anna Longo, Deleuze on Control and Resistance, J.P. Caron, From Blind Obedience to Normative Freedom and Real Abstraction and the Myths of the Given on post sellersian Marxism. Ross McElwain and Jay Springett, who are conducting Damon and Discord, Anatomy of the Tao, and Francesca Ainio, Bernard Stiegler's Thought on Technics. Jason Mohageg, is responsible for our transdisciplinary studies program. It explores the unique collusion between literature, poetry, anthropology, psychoanalysis, cultural studies, media theory, the arts, sciences, design, and vernacular knowledge by engaging with strategies that capture complexity, cultivate new ecologies of knowledge, and affect individual and collective transformations. This program can be considered as an alternative to cultural studies or comparative literature. In our fall winter 2022 season, this program will include a seminar by Jason titled The Great Game, Writings of a Lost Avant-Garde, a seminar by Michael Marder, Marder called The Phoenix, Reconfiguring Nature, and one by Romulo Moraes called The Theory of Kanye West as Artificial Cultural Intelligence. Cecile Manaspina is the programmer of our Art and Curatorial Practices program. Her program addresses the paradigm shifts brought on by new media technologies, but also cultivates historical analysis. Given that documented pasts are alive to us, both in the normative assumptions of arts institutions and in its speculations for the future. It introduces students to methodologies that are yet to be incorporated into the art curricula of accredited universities. By studying in the art and curatorial practice program, students and researchers will be able to account for the transformation of the meaning and practice of art in the 21st century and play a key role in shaping new possibilities provided by these changes. At this program, she will be teaching the seminars, Human Nature and the Technical Object, reading Simon Don, a survey seminar titled Techne Beyond Monoculture for the Art and Curatorial Practice Program. We will also have Mercedes Vincente teaching the seminar Dance Darcy Lange and the process of becoming. Ed Keller and Carla Leto are responsible for the Post Planetary Universal Design Program, which investigates how design practice can operate as a way of thinking of, projecting, and enacting structural changes in the world by entirely reimagining environmental paradigms, as well as the integration of disciplines and practices that produce them. Keller will be instructing the seminar Studio 3 Cosmological Brain through this program, which will also include seminars by Manuel Correa called Documentary Practices Between Verification and Reality Creation. 
Of course, as you can see, many of these seminars have topics that really traverse the program. If you check our website, you can see that many of them are cross-listed and do not belong to only one program. Let's begin with our programmer for the program of critical philosophy, Reza Negrestani. Reza Negrestani is a philosopher. He has contributed extensively to journals and anthologies and lectured at numerous international universities and institutes. His current philosophical project is focused on rationalist universalism, beginning with the evolution of the modern system of knowledge and advancing toward contemporary philosophies of rationalism, their procedures, as well as their demands for special forms of human conduct. He is the author of Cyclonopedia, Intelligence and Spirit, and of the forthcoming Abducting the Outside, to be published by MIT Press and distributed by Urbanomic. Reza, please take it away. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, it is great uh, that we have, uh, you know, another semester. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, given the obscene, the, you know, grave news these days, I think that, uh, you know, kind of the sort of intellectual endeavors and learnings uh, has a great uh, uh, can or not has uh, can have a you know a great theriopathic at least uh, you know uh, impact. Uh, I wouldn't call it a distraction, um, but nevertheless, uh, a certain sort of uh, moment of reprieve, uh, you know, from from you know the current world. Uh, not into quietude, but uh, in a certain sort of, you know, uh, kind of a Foucaultian negative freedom that allows us to do something um, um, positive. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, uh, as you know, I mean, the critical philosophy uh, program uh, you know, has been in operation, I think that uh, since 2014, and I joined as uh, as, a, as a programmer, I think it was 2016 or 17, if I can't remember correctly. Um, and, uh, you know, we have had, uh, you know, kind of uh, going through different avenues of inquiry, um, uh, and one of the main focus uh, or one of the main suppositions uh, of, of the critical philosophy department was that um, uh, that yes, we are in fact uh, uh, dealing with a certain sort of what I wouldn't call it an impasse or a deadlock or a stalemate, but an apparition of impasse in contemporary philosophy. Uh, I, I, I call it an apparition precisely because uh, I don't want to evoke any sort of, you know, uh, kind of like a um, dystopian or apocalyptic future for philosophy. But nevertheless, yes, there is an apparition uh, that, that there is a, a certain sort of blockage. But I would say that we have taken this apparition of the impasse or stalemate as uh, seriously as if it were true. To the extent that I would say that the sort of philosophical impasse uh, or apparition of it should be dealt with and engaged with as an opportunity, as a, as a form of enablement. Um, and um, it always reminds me of this uh, Charles Sanders Peirce uh, simile of walking on a bog or a marshland, where basically, uh, you know, um, we we are we have no choice, uh, and that's really what it means to navigate in the territory of philosophy. 
we have no choice other than, uh, you know, uh, telling ourselves that the ground for now at, the, at present seems to hold. And uh, here we stay, uh, we tell ourselves, until uh, the ground uh, beneath our feet uh, begins to give way and shift. And it is this shifting, this sort of um, precarity, this feeling of precarity and intellectual insecurity uh, by virtue of this shifting ground beneath our feet and that uh, I would say that uh, can be understood as an enabling motivation that sets off navigation, search for firmer ground, which, as we know, might in fact be another a stepping stone that we assume for the present. This is, you know, this is uh, uh, the ground that we must test. And I would say that this sort of apparition of impasse uh, can be also understood in this uh, sense that it is precisely the moment uh, when the ground give way and it uh, rightly so threatens uh, the illusion of having a strong foothold in the territory of conceptual intellection. And uh, this, for me, is, is a, a positive uh, sort of understanding of philosophy. And the whole program of critical philosophy has been somehow curated and put together around the sense of uh, escalating or exacerbating the sense of intellectual precarity by bringing certain sort of people who at once making constructive, positive contributions to philosophy, but also highlight this, uh, you know, this uh, consciousness of, uh, you know, uh, of the present moment of philosophy, not uh, being mistaken as a strong foundational foothold. And that drives them uh, to, to do groundwork again. Uh, to go back and, you know, search uh, you know, kind of philosophical concept, re, uh, uh, recognize them. Um, and um, through this procedure, uh, retesting some of, you know, the, the concepts or certain sort of philosophical ideas or methods, uh, that we have, uh, you know, we have thought that they are, are either dead or we have discarded them. And this is like, as I said, uh, this is uh, both a curse and a, a bless of uh, philosophy. The philosophy is one of the disciplines that never closes its circle of revenge. And... Uh, it pushes, always it makes history by churning its own past, right? Um, so yes, so we have this, uh, you know, we have this sort of um, kind of um, what you might call to be a paradigm of uh, how to uh, select the courses and work with um, the scholars and people who are exactly uh, so uh, navigating uh, the philosophical theory in this way. Um, and of course, this creates, uh, at least for students, a certain sort of, um, I wouldn't uh, call it a cinematic effect, but a certain sort of um, charm that, that, that I think that needs to be resurrected in philosophy. It kind of exposes the undergirding mechanism of philosophical thinking, uh, its precarity, its messiness, but also its precision, its uh, uncompromising precision, uh, which of course, for, um, for any person who, you know, initiates into the philosophical realm, this has a charm. Uh, 
perhaps even a libidinal charm, a uh, certain sort of excitement. And I think that this excitement is absolutely necessary and it's something that uh, uh, I have personally, um, uh, you know, uh, cultivated it among the students to, that it's not all about, you know, the arguments, the discussions, the grand ideas, and the, you know, the nitty grittiness of the critique, but also really uh, cherishing this, this excitement that can be adopted by one's life. Uh, so yes, uh, so this is uh, for people who want to enroll uh, in our program in critical philosophy. This is a, a highlight uh, they can think about. And uh, for this semester, yes, uh, so we have uh, J.P. Kaon, uh, who's uh, going to uh, continue uh, his work on Wittgenstein and um, uh, also, uh, I think, in autumn and uh, early winter is uh, providing a course uh, on uh, a kind of post sellarsian reading on of uh, you know the proponents of real abstraction uh, this is of course uh, due to uh, you know both uh, jean pierre's work but also a kind of resurgence of interest in uh, sondretto and you know uh, thesis of real abstraction uh, which I'm personally uh, quite curious about how this uh, course is going to unfold. And I'm pretty sure that uh, Jean-Pierre is going to be magnificent uh, uh, in this regard. Then we have uh, Anna Longo, uh, who is uh, going to talk about uh, Deleuze, uh, control and technology. Um, you know, uh, particularly the, uh, I would say, the, the target audience of this course are artists and philosophers uh, dealing uh, with technology, you know, and of course, uh, the backdrop uh, of the, you know, the sort of uh, technology which would be, you know, uh, capitalist, uh, you know, regime of, uh, acceleration and deterioralization. Um, then uh, we have uh, Francisca Einer, uh, that is uh, her second course in uh, New Center. Um, uh, she's an uh, astonishing philosopher uh, and she's going to present a, a course on uh, techne and uh, technique. Um, uh, through the lens of uh, Bernard Stiegler. Uh, and this, of, this course, of course, coincides uh, with uh, another course, uh, actually two courses that we have in common, uh, our, our program in critical philosophy have in common with uh, Cecile's uh, program. And that will be uh, the two courses are being taught by Cecile on uh, Simon John and uh, craft, uh, technique, and technology, uh, which are, again, I'm very curious about these courses uh, myself for the sake of my own personal projects. Uh, yes, uh, and ultimately I have, uh, again, I have a course. Uh, it would be a kind of continuation of my previous course on Freud, but this time, uh, you know, I'm going to uh, kind of, uh, so the first course was a kind of, uh, a, I would say that a staunch critique of some of the Freudian concepts. And now, in fact, I'm going to rehabilitate some of those concepts that I have uh, vehemently castigated in the previous course, but for a different purpose. And the topic of the course, I mean, is in the title, The Vicious Transparency of Time. And that is, of course, is a, is a reference, uh, tongue-in-cheek reference to Thomas Metzinger being no one. Uh, uh, is a statement about uh, phenomenal self that 
the transparency of phenomenal self is uh, a, a special form of darkness. And this is, uh, so the course works on this idea that the experience of time, uh, the conscious experience of time, and, uh, the, exp uh, and the, the time of consciousness, uh, their transparencies are a special forms of darkness. Um, essentially, that, that vicious transparency. And then uh, throughout the seminar, we are moving forward and looking at uh, you know, some of the uh, more insidious implications of this, uh, of this transparency, this so-called transparency uh, of time consciousness as a true form of the unconscious in a Freudian sense, as a preventive uh, form uh, uh, as a pre preventive factor uh, to the consciousness uh, and uh, the experience of consciousness of time. So that would be a uh, critical philosophy uh, for uh, you know, the upcoming seminars uh, uh, in uh, a few weeks uh, and also in autumn. And of, of course, uh, you know, the, the course by um, Ross and Jay on uh, Dao, which I have, I think, I introduced in the previous um, gathering, and I highly recommend it uh, to people who are interested in a kind of a critical yet constructive approach to, uh, you know, uh, the, the scene of uh, Dao, uh, you know, uh, NFT, and, you know, in a smaller sense, you know, um, uh, cryptocurrencies or crypto technologies rather than currencies, crypto technologies. Uh, so thank you. Uh, this is our program uh, for the upcoming season. Thank you, Reza. May these upcoming seminars help develop the philosophical solid ground of the future. Um, next, we have Jason Mahagir, who is the programmer for transdisciplinary studies. Jason is associate professor of comparative literature at Babson College. His scholarly focus is upon tracking currents of experimental thought between the Middle East and the West, with particular attention to exploring the concepts of chaos, violence, illusion, silence, madness, futurism, disappearance, and apocalyptic aesthetics. He has published several books, including The Chaotic Imagination, Inflictions, and the Radical Unspoken, to name a few. He is also the co-editor of the Suspensions book series with Bloomsbury Press and the co-director of the Fifth Disappearance Lab. So please, Jason, can you tell us more about the transdisciplinary program as well as the seminars? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I'm uh, enlivened that this term the Transdisciplinary Studies Program has the occasion of offering three seminars, uh, all of which promise to be exceptionally rare, immersive, and powerful excursions in their own right. I'll talk about the first two that are uh, eight session seminars first, and then mention how the third, which uh, uh, is being elaborated, how that functions kind of as almost a capstone to the first two explorations. So uh, on one side, you can kind of see behind me, but I'll share a screen to make it easier on everyone here. So on one side, uh, we have a seminar with Professor Michael Martyr, uh, who's crafted an original course that he's never taught elsewhere. And um, for those who might not know, uh, Michael Martyr is, in my estimation, one of the most impressive minds of this generation. He's also one of the most prolific authors one could encounter with uh, well over 20 books uh, written at this point on conceptual realms ranging from energy, waste, vegetal being, pyropolitics, utopia, 
Uh, he has these beautiful phenomenological works on dust and nuclear disasters like those of Chernobyl. Uh, for our purposes at the new center though, he's traversing into totally fresh terrain by exploring a multifarious philosophy of nature uh, through the explosive image of the Phoenix, uh, which for those I'm sure most of you know is a half earthly, half solar bird that burns itself alive in this great display of combustion and return. Uh, and so the course itself is titled The Phoenix, Nature Reconfigured. And Michael Martyr is going to presumably track the Phoenix paragon in the Western philosophical schools of Plato and Levinas, but then through to ancient Egyptian and Roman thought, Confucianism, Hinduism, and Russian cosmos. And at each turn, this Phoenix figure allows him to consider the most complex formulations of ideas of devastation, regeneration, cyclicality, and then to apply them to the environmental catastrophes of our own era, to include melting ice worlds, desertification, famine, pollution of irreversible proportions. On my own side, I'm teaching a seminar on a lesser known avant-garde circle of four French youths who were known as the Great Game, Le Grand Jou. Uh, they experimented with writing in the midst of drug visions, near-death experience, uh, and anesthesia until their alliance collapsed and they were dispersed to four corners. One of them became a mystic who traveled through the Eastern mountains to meet with various sages. And another died tragically young in the back room of a Parisian bar jamming a dirty morphine needle into his leg. Uh, I've been mesmerized by this cryptic intimate group called the Great Game for years. They were only 16 in that picture when they began. Uh, and I never, but I never wanted to expose or teach them until recently. So now for various reasons, I find myself motivated to attempt a close reading of their previously silenced text. Uh, I think they're an obscure secret society which really puts all others to shame for those who are interested in 20th century secret societies. Uh, and I want to trace their stellar rise to these ingenious states of imagination, but also the reasons for their exhaustion and disintegration from those heights of creative reflection. So the incre intriguing question is, what is the connection between these two seminars uh, for the transdisciplinary program? Why are they being taught in simultaneity? Uh, and do these courses share some unspoken or underlying vision? They appear to have very asynchronous arcs. So again, on my side, we'll be keeping company with a faction of adolescent prodigies who tested themselves by consuming the poisonous leaves of exotic trees. They ingested strychnine, opium, and carbon tetrachloride, which is a cleaning fluid and insect killer. They tried mastering sightless movement by riding bicycles or running through the streets of their city blindfolded. They dabbled with what was called paroptic vision, which is like trying to look into a box and grasp its hidden contents without using actual sight. And they wrote about being prophets and lost princes in conditions of mild auto asphyxiation and while placing sharpened instruments against each other's jugular heads. And they used to also stand for hours in front of mirrors staring at their own likenesses until the surface took on an eerie uncanny quality and started to tremble, which then allowed them to watch themselves as a kind of stranger inside the glass. On the other side though, uh, again, Professor Martyr will be extracting an immemorial figure of storytelling myth and philosophy, the Phoenix, which is no mere symbol or sacred metaphor, but rather for him, the cipher to perhaps a fatally dangerous paradigm of nature uh, that underpins human consciousness which is the suspicion that we possess some miraculous rejuvenating power and can overthrow finality like some self-immolating bird rising from the ashes. And Michael Martyr, Michael Martyr will demonstrate precisely how this often unconscious delusion of terrestrial immortality, which is at the heart of our political ideologies, corporate entities, and even humanist philosophies since the beginning of civilization, how it, it, uh, it's complicit in rationalizing the depletion of the earth. But again, what's compelling to me about staging these dual gestures in the same breath of the coming semester is that they unlock doors into one another's territories from the opposite direction. So at certain levels, you'd think that the game as a concept, as in the group of writers who I'm teaching called, who called themselves the great game, with games being contrived machinations and performances of arbitrarily fashioned rules, something like that must be diametrically opposed to something like nature which often carries assumptions of authenticity and essence. But what's interesting here is that the young thinkers of the great game engineered these weird schemes and plots exactly in order to touch something that they called the universal, which they defined as a paradoxically intimate yet cold submergence in some inhuman God's void 
or in their words, quote, the impersonal instant of eternity and emptiness. So the game was simply an apparatus that unlatched a gate into the eternal, the cosmic and the infinite. So in a similar double move then, Michael Martyr's seminar presumably starts from the premise of the eternal and the infinite body of a legendary creature of nature, exactly in order to solve the riddles of modern technological extinction and erasure in the, of, in the age of artificiality. So the game and nature meet conceptually as they flip into one another at certain extreme limits of possibility. Moreover, if we take the classical separation of games into four categories, those of skill, those of chance, those of role playing, and those of pure sensation. So a skill game is like chess, a chance game is like playing the lottery or a slot machine, role playing games are like going to a costume party or video games, and sensation games are like riding roller coasters or going skydiving. Then this allows us to ask the radical question, which is what if we treated the universe, existence, reality, whatever you wanna call this atmosphere that envelops us as a game? Which of those four games does our being in the world resemble? Do we need intelligence, luck, transformative disguises, or visceral instinct to survive it? Or is the event of our being, like the Phoenix's violent exhibition, a kind of ritual trial by fire whose victory or defeat spells the ecstasy or annihilation of all things? Is this a game we're destined to lose? Can the players cheat in this game? Can its unspoken rules even be decoded or bent in our favor? Or is it simply an empty diversion to kill time as time slowly kills us? These are some of the inquiries that we'll chase after in both of those main seminars this fall. And in a strange way, these two main seminars coincide nicely with a very elaborate third seminar, uh, which is a four session seminar being offered uh, in uh, sort of uh, in conjunction between transdisciplinary studies and art and curatorial practice, devised by Homlo Moraes, uh, who for many of you may not know, uh, in a fascinating ascension, uh, went from being a certificate student uh, of ours years ago, uh, then to being part of the inner circle of the administrative team of the new Center for Research and Practice, and then now uh, arriving again in a kind of eternal return as an instructor with a, with a fascinating course uh, on the horizon. And what he's looking at, what uh, Omelo is looking at here, are the, the uh, iconic dynamics of a figure like Kanye West in order to theorize a new form of what he calls artificial cultural intelligence. So by deploying currents uh, as far reaching as Afrofuturism, monodology, media archeology, span symbolic anthropology, and black techno poetics, Omelo's seminar would decode how a singular hip hop artist might break open the door to a new epochality of fabulation. One that culminates with the rapper declaring himself a living God. Hence, once again, we see how a certain will to ciphering and atmospheric manipulation indeed unfastens the gateway to some experience of apotheosis and the immortal. So I think that's what puts the trans into the transdisciplinary uh, for, for, this, uh, for this semester from the streets uh, to the gods. Uh, looking forward to it, it should be an exciting uh, triumvirate of courses and uh, hope to see everyone there. Thank you, Jason. They sound really exciting, these seminars. Um, let's move on to art and curatorial practice with Cecile Malaspina. Malaspina is the program director at the Paris International College of Philosophy, CIPH, where she is also a member of the executive board. She is visiting fellow at King's College London where her program for the CIPH is hosted by the Departments of Digital Humanities and the Department of French in association with the Center for Art and Philosophy. She is the author of An Epistemology of Noise and principal translator of Gilbert Semondon's On the Mode of Existence of Technical Objects with the collaboration of John Rogo. Cecile, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me here to introduce the, my part of, of this fantastic program. And 
thanks to the new center for having invited me relatively recently. So this is a, the second seminar of my cooperation, collaboration with the center. And um, it's just, it's a fantastic honor, not only to be working with such extraordinary colleagues, uh, to intersect the seminars I organize with these other seminars that often are transversal to our different programs. And also I have to say the students have completely blown me away. I, I, I think it's it's a tremendous honor to be working with such a diversity of super creative intellects. And yeah, it's it's been it's been a blast. I've, I've really had a fantastic time and I'm expecting the next seminar to go on the same high note. So I'm going to be saying a couple of words now about um, the three specific seminars that I'll be organizing and welcoming also all the other transversal cinema seminars that will be happening both with in conjunction with my program in fine art or in rather in art practice and curatorial practice and with the other programs. So one thing I want to say perhaps by way of introduction is that the approach I'm interested in for this program is a um, problem-based. I would like to say concept-based, but I actually think that the concept comes after the problem. The problem is more important than the concept. So in a way, it's a um, it has a heavy philosophical bias, but not in such a way that art practice and curatorial practice should um, be inspired by or learn from philosophy, but in the sense that aesthetics and the, those who work in the fields in, of, of art practice produce problems for philosophy that are worthy of philosophy. And in that way, I think there is a kind of subterraneous philosophical work going on in disciplines that aren't specifically academically um, philosophical, specifically speaking. So that's uh, just a couple of words of introduction here to explain why uh, it's not straightforwardly a seminar about artists a lot of the time, but um, often about problems that generate philosophical developments in a way that kind of um, creates a kind of ecosystem between um, artistic practice and philosophical practice, rather than thinking of, of a kind of a hierarchy between them in terms of concepts or um, aesthetic production. So I hope that made sense. Uh, so let me say a couple of words about the different seminars. So, where have they disappeared to? One, I'm very very happy to introduce uh, Mercedes Vicente, uh, who is going to run a um, two credit seminar on Darcy Lange and the process of becoming. I'm just gonna read the description here. Her seminar will explore the work of the Maori artist Darcy Lange, uh, who died in 2005, a drawing from her own forthcoming monograph, the process of becoming, the video making of Darcy Lange, which is going to be published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2023. So this is all uh, research hot off the press, if you like. Um, her seminar examines the legacy of this pioneer video artist and is in the, his situated video practice in labor, education and indigenous struggles as it is shaped by and resisting the artistic, cultural and political preoccupations of the 1970s and 80s. It establishes a wide array of theoretical approaches to his singular practice, from conceptual art to social documentary, community video, art as social practice and activism, expanding the understanding of video art outside the predominant structuralist tendencies and cultural history of the neo-avant-garde practices at the time. Lange's works uh, are cornerstones for his critique of modernism through participation and practice in non-artistic contexts, bridging politics and aesthetics, and anticipating the socially engaged art of today. It also investigates Lange's transnational tra trajectory, acknowledging his legacy and challenging the Western canon that excluded him in the past uh, by nationalistic definitions of British art. So just to say a couple of words also about uh, Mercedes. Mercedes is a, um, an outstanding curator, writer, and researcher. She's currently associate tutor in critical and historical studies at the Royal College of Art in London. 
She's held positions uh, as Director of Education and Public Programs at the Whitechapel Gallery in London, Curator of Contemporary Art at the Govett Brewster Art Gallery in New Zealand, and Curatorial Assistant uh, positions at uh, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. And um, I could go on, but uh, we don't have so much time. So she's she's really uh, a real gem. I'm, I'm very excited that she's going to be running one of the programs. So the next program I want to describe briefly, uh, and you'll see a kind of common thread emerge from that, uh, is one I'll be running. It's going to be also a short um, to credit seminar entitled Human Nature and the Technological Object. And it's going to be a slanted reading of Simon Don. So it's going to be specifically about his text, but also with, intersect with intersections um, crossing over to issues concerning artistic production. So a quick description of that. Um, this is about the question of man's place in nature today, which presents itself in a stark opposition between nature and technology, which is something that uh, the, all the seminars in this uh, program are going to be um, tackling uh, in a, critically, if you, if you like, in, in a non-technophobe way. So locked in an end game of what seems to be an asymmetrical antagonism, Technology is seen as threatening the viability of biodiversity on Earth, raising dystopian visions of the obliteration of human life on Earth and consequently of the recovery or ultimate victory of an indifferent cosmos. cosmos. In this, sorry, it's a one credit seminar. I, I get confused with numbers sometimes. In this one credit seminar, we'll revisit the notions of nature and human nature through this slanted reading of Gilbert Simondon's book on the mode of existence of technical objects, uh, which has been translated in 2017 by myself and John Rokov, and will distinguish at least three nuances in this conceptualization of nature. We'll look at, nature, at this concept of nature in a structural sense as a concept that designates a regime of elements, we look at it in a functional sense as what lends itself to a process of individuation. And we'll, you know, we'll develop this concept of individuation in, in some depth. And in a more fundamental metaphysical sense where nature can be understood as the unlimited, the formless or infinite corresponding to the Greek concept aperon, the, um, what is without limit or without form. So this will enable us to discern surprises in Simon Dahl's understanding of nature and in his understanding of the nature of things according to their essence, implying a startling understanding also of human nature. So in this seminar, we'll broach Simon Dahl's richly faceted conceptualization of nature as one that is not based on dichotomies between the natural and the artificial, or between the human and other species, implying also an ethics that abhors the mythical inclination towards technocracy, if anything, as a misunderstanding of technical essence or of, if you like, the nature of technicity. So that's the program I'll be running myself. And then I also want to introduce um, a, survey, a survey seminar where I have been able to, what I can't see you anymore, where are you guys? Where I've been able to invite a, a truly phenomenal cast of speakers. I'm, I'm really excited that they all said yes. Um, so first of all, I'm, I'm going to in introduce the speakers that uh, are going to participate in this survey seminar um, on uh, technical monoculture or the monoculture of techni, or rather, well, I'll get into that in a second. So Patricia Reed is someone that uh, a lot of you will already be familiar with. I'm so excited to have um, been able to convince her to participate despite her very uh, busy calendar. Uh, she's an artist, writer, and designer. Um, recent, recent writings of hers have been published in um, Pages Magazine, Glass Beads, uh, Construction Site for Possible Worlds, Urbanomic, Eflux Journal, Making and Breaking, uh, Platforms with Sternberg, uh, and uh, many more. And uh, Reed, Patricia Reed is also part of the Laboria Kubonics Working Group, whose uh, Xenofeminist Manifesto, which was published in 2015, um, many of you will be familiar with. Um, we will also be hearing from Jim Shrub, Jim Shrub, who has been uh, running a wonderful seminar for me in my last uh, semester, 
which was called From Music and Cosmicity to Sound and Interiority. Uh, Jim Schwab is a PhD student at the University Paris Nanterre uh, in philosophy, and he's um, already making a name for himself um, with his outstanding scholarship on Simon Don. Uh, but I don't think that's uh, going to be the main focus of his of his contribution to this seminar. Uh, another speaker I'm very excited to have um, been able to, to convince to participate here is um, Yagmo Denizan, who is a professor in um, engineering, in electronics and elect electrical and electronics engineering, with a specialization in chaos control, modeling of nonlinear dynamic systems, and modeling of biological systems. But she's also a philosopher who's worked for many years uh, on Simon Don and on biosemiotics. And um, so she's she's for sure, for sure going to bring uh, an unusual perspective to this seminar. And it was also very important for me, and this is something I would like to just say about the program as a whole, to involve uh, practitioners from a diversity of fields. So, so as to kind of break out of the, um, the, the risk of navel gazing that you can have sometimes have in, in kind of closed theoretical ecosystems. So another speaker who's going to participate is Daniela Foss. Um, who teaches at the University of Hildesheim. She's um, very well known for her work on Simon Don also, although this is not what she's going to talk about here. She works also on uh, French post-structuralism, phenomenology, um, contemporary philosophy, and uh, aesthetics and philosophy of technology. Uh, then we also have uh, Betty Marenko, uh, who is, is a uh, reader in contextual studies and leader of the BA product in industrial design at uh, Central St. Martin's in London. She's a design theorist, academic, educator, public speaker, and consultant. And her work is located at the intersection of uh, philosophy and design. Uh, then I have also, there's uh, three more to go. There's uh, Anne Lefebvre, who is a uh, longstanding uh, collaborator of mine. Uh, she's um, uh, works at the Centre de Recherche in Design at the École Normale Supérieure Paris-Saclay. And she was, uh, she founded a research institute there that she's been uh, leading for a long time. And then there is uh, Kirill uh, Potapov, uh, who is associate editor for the journal Culture and Educational, Culture and Education. And uh, he's also program developer and counselor um, teacher, thinker, and um, he works at um, he works on the uh, theorist Lev, Vygot Lev Vygotsky's sociocultural theory of cognitive development. And one of the reasons that uh, we got in a, into a, this kind of, um, if I may say, in the philosophical context, charmed um, conversation uh, and enthusiasm was um, that we discovered a really interesting intersection between uh, Vygotsky's own kind of specific approach to sociocultural theory of cognitive development and Simon Don's pedagogical techno philosophy, if you like. So also this, a lot of these people are, have a kind of Simon Don connection, but this is not going to be the, the theme of this uh, seminar. I just kind of mention it for the background. And very importantly, we'll also um, uh, be hearing from Rafael Pedroso, who all of you know from the new center and who's been uh, truly phenomenal in helping me to set up uh, this, this seminar and uh, also all the other seminars in the previous semester and who has kind of welcomed me into the fold and, and um, helped me with technical details like a noise cancellation where my voice couldn't be heard whenever I tried to speak on Zoom. So he's um, also worthy of introduction, even if all of you know him. Rafael is a Brazilian independent scholar. He holds a master in international relations at PUC Rio with a thesis focused on reading Marx in the Anthropocene by weaving together Marxist ecology and media theory. He's currently finishing a certificate in critical philosophy at the New Center for Research and Practice, where he also works, as I just said. So I'm going to conclude now by saying just a few words about techne beyond monoculture. So the motivate where the motivation for this seminar came from. Um, this seminar offers multiple lines of inquiry addressing a commonplace 
whereby the crafts are frequently presented as uniquely nurturing and preserving local and even national cultural individuality, in contrast with a monoculture brought about by the standardization of modern global capitalist technologies. So this seminar will question the intuitive opposition between crafts and technology on at least two fronts. On the one hand, this often promoted idea of the crafts as preserving local and national identity, which I believe belies the complex international networks that have historically enabled not only the exchange of ideas necessary for the development of crafts, but also the provision of specialized materials and tools. And I recall, for instance, Levi Strauss's remark um, that this is characteristic of humanity, that in, that in its very essence, human and social progress from an anthropological point of view can only exist in so far as different centers of human culture are in contact and that isolated societies are inert societies and that only societies in contact with each other progress. This is what he said in a, in a little book published in 2016 uh, called Montaigne après Montaigne, or Montaigne after Montaigne. So on the other hand, it is of the utmost urgency today to question also the grounds on which techno-scientific rationality is commonly reduced to or held accountable solely for what Herbert Marcuse called the performance principle of capitalism. One could also argue that this is a facile critique of techno-scientific rationality, one that concedes too critical a part of human inventiveness to the logic of capitalism. So this survey seminar will unite all these amazing thinkers that I just mentioned from fields as diverse as philosophy, engineering, design, political theory, developmental psychology, and aesthetics to reformulate the following problem in line with their own research, and therefore not with a focus on Simon Don. Uh, and the question is roughly this, how can we rethink and how can we ultimately emancipate the sprawling of contemporary techni from, from a capitalist monoculture? and from the inanity of its performance principle and without relying on national particularities as an imagined panacea against capitalist alienation. So I think I've, uh, I haven't forgotten anyone important or any of the seminars that we're going to be running. And yeah, thanks again to everyone for welcoming me into the fold and, and for allowing me to be part of, of what is really a truly extraordinary place of encounter, the new center. Thanks so much for being with us this year. Um, really looking forward to these guest speakers and seminars. Last but not in the very least is Post-Planetary Universal Design with Ed Keller and Carla Leto. Ed and Carla are the founders of AUM Studio and spec.ae, which joined the Data Matter group show at the Venice Biennale in 2018. Keller and Leitao have con convened over 20 international conferences and lecture series. Their work and writing has appeared in Volume, Punctum, Triple Ampersand, Evolo, A Plus U, AD, Metamorphosis, Wired, Metropolis, and many others. Today, we only have Ed with us here, and I will introduce him. Ed is a designer, professor, writer, musician, multimedia artist, and independent scholar. From 2012 to 2020, he was the director of Center for Transformative Transformative Media, CTM, at the New School. Associate Dean at Parsons College from 2010 to 2012. And from 2009 to 2020 was Associate Professor at Parsons. My bad, from 2009 to 2010 was Associate Professor at Parsons. He has spoken on architecture, film, artificial intelligence, technology and ecology internationally. He has also recently done seminars at the new school on topics such as post-planetary design, 
soundscape and designing AI. Ed, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anshul. Uh, good day, everyone. I second uh, Cecile's comments that it's an incredible honor to participate in the New Center project uh, and an incredible pleasure to hear what everybody is working on and what everyone is going to be teaching over the coming semester. Uh, Carla can't join us today. She's traveling today and tomorrow. Uh, but a word about uh, Carla and myself. Carla is an architect licensed in Europe. She's also a full-time faculty at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where she teaches advanced architectural design studios and history theory in the architecture program there. Uh, my training as an architect uh, follows my earlier training as a composer and as a musician. And uh, I have to say that I've been constantly trying to restitch those disciplines back together over the past three decades. Uh, and that progress uh, is never ending and that process continues. I'd like to start by just saying a few words about the post-planetary program uh, and then talk a little bit about the upcoming seminars. We started the post-planetary universal design program as a hybrid seminar and research, research studio curriculum. Uh, it, nominally based in architecture and design, if you will, but uh, it's not restricted in any sense in that students attending the program can and should be undergraduate or graduate in design or across many disciplinary fields, seeking a track that would accelerate their work and develop skill sets in critically engaging contemporary design, thinking through design and um, thinking across disciplinary boundaries and silos. We want to engage some core questions in the program uh, by surveying precise disciplinary modes of thinking and designing. We would ask for whom and for which timescales is design intended and how does it operate across those timescales? We would say that um, thinking design, it functions as an amplifier or an attenuator for the planetary, for what we could call broad spectrum codex of historical, material, organic, and socio-technical configurations. You know, if, if you look at architecture specifically, it has always operated across many temporal arcs, from the moment of a gesture, or the life of a single organism, to the millennia-long arc of a building's existence, or a city's existence, or a law's existence or an ecosystem's existence. And historically, architecture works to capture and to fix and transmit stable configurations of past order into the future. Um, we use architecture as a stand-in, in that sense, for the way that other disciplines operate across different temporal arcs. And of course, the, the um, socio-geopolitical and technical instrumentation that we live in today uh, sets up unique and unprecedented configurations and offers novel resistances to previous ways that we would define architecture and define design. So Carl and I have been interested in projecting across and into alternate configurations of the past and of the future. And the program really has the intention to identify points of intervention. We're interested in, in critically understanding how systems and models function, but then leveraging them immediately in terms of intervention to, um, to, to run the gamut from we're proposing buildings and urban interventions, yes, to designed biology, to designed governance systems, um, and ultimately new forms of designed intelligence uh, for world environments yet to come, and rethinking the, the problem of um, systemic and ecosystemic design at all times. So, for example, at least in my case, for the past few years, Aldo Leopold's work and his writings in Sand County Almanac has proved um, quite wonderful and helpful in, in rethinking deep ecology and um, land ethics in relationship to systemic design. In one of our seminars last year, the Atmospheres Seminars, which was a survey seminar, Nandita Biswas Malampi was a guest, and I, I want to read a, a brief quote from one of her texts, which sets the kind of framework for what we'll be doing over the, uh, the coming semester. Nandina was writing about the science fiction novel Dune by Frank Herbert when she wrote this text. The text is titled Terra and Terror Ecology, Secrets from the Arakeen Underground. Uh, it's a very beautiful text by Nandita. She says, 
humans have an extremely specific role to play in this planetological ecovision. The human, in this case, especially those who are Fremen, the native inhabitants of the planet Dune, the human is a life form that can scientifically track not only its own movement, along with that of other elements within a milieu, but that can also uncover and manipulate the mechanisms underlying such movement. To the working planetologist, his most important tool is human beings. Hence, one must cultivate ecological literacy among the people. This is why I have created an entirely new form of ecological notation. That's a quote from one of the characters in Dune. Nandita goes on to say, ecological design becomes the general, or rather the generic activity of localizing, translating, and transcribing movement across a landscape. And all symbolic, logical, and normative considerations are considered to be effects of this primarily generic gestural mechanism of movement. The physical qualities of a planet are written into its economic and political record. We have the record in front of us and our course is obvious. That was a second quote from one of the characters in Dune. Nandana fin Nandita finishes by saying, it is the diagrammatic quality of ecological notation that allow allows this Gaia Terra ecology, on the one hand to take on a generalist or non-local perspective within the local context of a given field landscape milieu, and on the other hand, to be a cut and fit science. Now, this is a, a very brief quote from Nandita's beautiful text, within which she unpacks the, the opportunity to develop a gestural ecology, a notational system and a system of modeling larger and smaller systems interlocked and nested within each other. And this is a very, I think, a very useful way of thinking the arc of what the post-planetary design program has tried to do over the past year and a half. Uh, we've moved from running research studios that look at world to seminars that look at atmospheres as generic frameworks to understand the behavior of systems, to attempting to define what the limits of cosmos would be. And we look forward to this coming year to think about the cosmological brain. Um, but I get ahead of myself before I, before I leap into the, um, the seminar descriptions. What we've done across the past year has attempted to, um, to as I say, make a leap in scale to end point, not with the thinking of the universal only, but to constantly jump back and forth in scale, temporal scale and physical scale, to understand what the interrelationships between those systems might be, what the isomorphisms might be, what the as above's, so below's might be, disciplinarily speaking, that allow us to think as designers and hijack material from one design specific form of practice and thinking and uh, export it or import it into another. Um, for example, some ongoing seminars in the program that are also cross-listed, as, uh, as everyone has pointed out, beautifully cross-listed with the other programs, include Colin Drum's Science, Designs, and Sovereignty seminar that uh, I believe just concluded in July, Thomas Mikal's Acid Ecosophy for a Kaleidoscopic Machinic Phylum seminar, which is concluding shortly, I believe, in August, and Stephanie Wakefield's Anthropocene Design, Infrastructure, Imagination, and Experimentation at the End seminar, which is ongoing and concludes in uh, a few weeks in September. So these are these are uh, some of the projects that link into these scalar modes of thinking shifts that Carla and I have been working on embedding. Uh, and upcoming in uh, September to March, we have Manuel Correa's Documentary Practices Between Verification and Reality Creation seminar, and the Studio 3 Cosmological Brain Designing for Worlds, Minds for Worlds seminar, which Carla and I will be teaching. Let me talk a little bit about Manuel's seminar and introduce Manuel first. Manuel was one, in fact, one of the New Center's first certificate students back in 2014, and his work has enduringly tried to challenge the parameters of documentary filmmaking. He's a Colombian Spanish artist and filmmaker whose work explores memory and post-conflict reconstruction in contemporary societies. His work is exemplified by the difficult task of negotiating highly complex and fragile social relations formed in the aftermath of trauma. He's used documentary filmmaking as a tool through which to bring people together, creating meeting points for war victims, survivors, activists, and scientists. 
He has an MA research architecture from Goldsmith College, University of London, and is currently working as part of the Forensic Architecture Project. His work has been presented internationally in numerous venues, Rotterdam International Film Festival, Museo Tamayo in Mexico, many, many others. And he's currently starting a research unit in Madrid called Oficina de Investigación Documental. Let me read the description from Manuel's seminar. Qu quote, we all carry cameras with us all the time, everywhere. The documentation of events such as social outbursts in Colombia, Chile, Argentina, and Hong Kong show us the impact that cell phone video and photography have had on documentary practice. Devoid of the practitioner's traditional agency, these videos complicate the notion of source truth and their analysis and media framings play a vital role in world making and the consolidation of political narratives. Documentary filmmaking has always confronted the notion of truth by complicating and expanding it, but more often than not, by accepting it as an anachronic binarism of truth versus false. This seminar will engage with the investigative potentials and shortcomings of audiovisual data. We will dissect different types of contemporary practices and their abilities to produce and affect the future through documentary language. We will problematize, Correa says, we will problematize the notion of camera as witness, consider the role of false memories, lapses, and witness tampering in the process of truth making. We will discuss examples of spatial techniques developed by researchers to help the witness remember past events and consider the evidentiary nature of archives and their potential and shortcomings when researching towards documentary practices. So this is a very beautiful project, obviously, and it dovetails quite precisely with the arc across post-planetary universal design in attempting to think the um, techno-social practices that enable sentience and sapience, or which disable sentience and sapience in the current platform and world and that we fit within. So the, the research studio that Carla and I will be teaching in the spring, Studio 3 Cosmological Brain, is a, an extension, not necessarily a conclusion, but an extension of the arc from world to atmosphere to cosmos. And in this, we pose the question, are we designing worlds for minds or minds for worlds? We're approaching the project to create or to cultivate a cosmological brain. Obviously, standing behind us are um, giant figures like Stanislaw Lem, whose work we adore in, um, in works like his master's voice or Solaris. We ask in this research studio, what are the sociopolitic genetics, the pedagogies of general economy, the environmental controls necessary to build a cosmopolitically inclined mind? What are the infrastructural captures of attention that are currently in operation on our planet today in 2022, 2023, which might lead toward or away from a general cosmopolitical agency? We begin by temporarily distinguishing and isolating technical and conceptual parts of the thinking entity to inquire into novel ways to design these substructures and bring them back together in a renewed framework of assembly. And the studio will explore and work with different aspects of planetary and universally skilled cognitive architectures and the systems through which potential general intellects might operate, ranging from biological artifacts functioning across billions of years as J.G. Ballard pointed out in his 60s disaster novels like The Drowned World and The Crystal World, and the kind of artifacts that are, that are um, memories of physical chemical crises that took place many millennia ago in our bodies. So these, are these biological artifacts or cultural infrastructures or linkages of structures of feeling from the viral scale to general principles of feedback and self-regulation and awareness looking at all the pathways for material, energetic, and information systems to interact across these myriad time scales to yield a range of kinds of mind. Um, we don't know what the, the world for mind or mind for world will do. It's a research studio that um, will speculate on exactly what it would mean to either design a world for a particular kind of mind, to tease out a particular kind of mind, or to design a particular kind of mind that would yield a world. And this course extends and draws on many of the themes that we've developed in the lecture series that we've run over the past few years, the foundation series uh, that Carla put together, the overview effect in the cosmopolitics that we ran for the Venice Architecture Biennale last year, um, 
in collaboration with a number of, of folks at the new center. Um, I'm thinking quite specifically, Jason, of the amazing work that you did in your Future Studies Initiative and all of the lectures and workshops that you put together for that particular series. Uh, we will have guests coming in in the, um, the Cosmological Brain Research Studio. Uh, these are to be announced, but uh, in the past, we've had folks like Ben Gertzel join us, um, Angelo Vermwellen, Nora Khan, Lydia Calipoliti, Peter Watts, and uh, I would imagine that since our focus will be on world and mind, uh, we will see if we can get folks like Ben and, and Peter Watts uh, and Nora to join us again in the spring. So that's the arc there. And again, I, I just want to say once again, what an incredible pleasure it is. I, I, I second the comment that uh, I think Cecil made that, you know, the conversations we have in these in these seminars with the groups that join are phenomenal. And we're really looking forward to the next year. Thanks. Thank you, Ed. It's so exciting. And I can't help but notice your Zoom background. It looks like something that's been generated by Mid Journey. It's very yeah. fascinating. Yeah, it's one of it's one of many imaginary landscapes generated by the machine elves that I've been having midnight soirees with over the past six months. <laughs> Nice. Um, with that, we conclude presentations on upcoming seminars. You can find information about all these on our website. Again, applications to register are open until September 5th, with the possibility to receive partial and full scholarships. You can check the website or our social media handles for details. Before we leave, I would like to invite Hermilo. Um, Romulo, you've been working as the intake officer. You're one of our researchers who's completed our certificate programs and received a Fulbright scholarship to complete your PhD in musicology in New York. So as the intake officer who's interviewing incoming students, would you have any tips or suggestions that you'd like to share with us? Um, hi, Anshal. Thank you for that. Um, yes, I'll, I'll, as you mentioned, I'm sort of the main kind of admis admission officer for this semester. Uh, and I'm also kind of coordinating this program that the new center is doing with uh, ISAP in Portugal, the uh, Escola Superior Artística do Porto, uh, which I think uh, Cecile is teaching there and Reza and some other instructors of ours. Um, and I'll also be instructing a summer this season, as Jason mentioned, uh, and I, I wanted to thank Jason for the kind words too. Uh, but more than like a suggestion or a tip for people, I just wanted to invite everyone to apply. You know, Mo uh, called me to say some words about the application process. Uh, so I'm not sure if this is our suggestions per se, because the process is really kind of malleable and flexible to the different kind of people we uh, that apply and th that are kind of wildly different in their goals and interests. And we are sort of very open for different kinds of applications. So there's no really a formula of any kind. Um, but I just wanted to like highlight how the process is actually really quick and, and not like hard at all. Uh, so applying is very simple. It's just a, a writing sample or a working sample, even a portfolio that you probably already have if you're interested in applying and a short, very short cover letter, just explaining why you think you need or you uh, deserve uh, some funding. Um, so we've got these amazing courses and seminars and, and, and programs. So if you're interested in anything that you heard today, um, or if you're just enticed by the courses, you know, libidinally, as Reza said, if you're just interested in that, if that gets you going, or if you like, you're in academia, you, you feel like that is not, you know, what you expected, or it's very bureaucratic or very careerist, um, you know, the scholarships will be very generous, uh, this semester I've been told. And we have two full scholarships for just for Ukrainian students. So if you're from Ukraine, uh, just you know, might as well. And we also have an automatic 50% deduction from people for uh, people from the global south. So if you're interested in uh, just watching the videos, you can also buy the membership, which is on a sale right now, which is just uh, $75 for a year, and you can watch uh, watch all the videos from the New Center's archive. Uh, but again, I highly recommend applying to the scholarships. The worst that could happen, you know, is uh, not getting it. Uh, but you know, you never know. When I applied, I also didn't have any expectation of getting it, and I got this 
partial thing and it helped me out a lot and I got to work. And as Jason like mentioned, there was a lot of room to grow and uh, to, even to the point of doing my own research and presenting that as a new uh, center instructor right now. Um, so this is just an invitation for all of you to apply until September 5th. Uh, and just a clarification that this process is not like as menacing as it might look from the outside. It's very, very simple, swift. And uh, we try to just answer everyone and be kind to everyone, you know. Uh, so that's it. Thank you, everyone. It's uh, like a beautiful kind of conversation session. And I hope to see uh, everyone who is watching at the new center next season. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's super encouraging and helpful. Um, that's all from our end. Thank you so much for your time and attention. We look forward to seeing you in our seminars. Thank you.